Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of The Partial Historians. I am Dr. G. And I am Dr. Rad. Looking fabulous as usual. Oh, well, you always give me such a nice compliments and I always forget to give you <laughs> I think it's just because you're just so naturally beautiful. I don't think I need to say it. The camera can see you this time, so they can see it's true. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> So we have been tracing Rome's history from the foundation of the city. That we have. And it's been a wild ride so far. Mm -hmm. And it's only going to get worse, I think. <laughs> We're entering into this period. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> we promised at the end of the previous episode that it was going to be better. <laughs> oh, look, I can't make any guarantees about what I may or may not have promised at the end of the last episode. Um, I don't know. We're entering into this period where we're going to see more and more dictators. So I think, that, you know... Hey, we've seen some already, but just you wait. You ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. If, yeah, we're heading down that kind of path. Definitely. So to do a quick recap, Dr. G, of where we're at in this journey of Rome from the founding of the city, deep in the Roman Republic that we are, we just covered the year 436. And in 436, we saw quite a few things happening in my account. We saw a little bit of raiding happening, but nothing too serious on the military front. And then you had some detail about some of the domestic occurrences that were going on. I did, but I mean, my sources are pretty thin on the ground right now, and I feel like I'm not really building any sort of narrative momentum myself in yeah. sort of understanding what's happening in this period, and it's partly because my great friend, my solace in hard times, Dionysus of Halicarnassus, is missing! <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly what we saw in the bits that you put together and the bits that I had from Livy was that there is seemingly another tribune of the plebs called Spurius Malleus who is trying to seek vengeance, or in his words, justice, against the men who were involved in either murdering or triggering the murder of the original Spurious Malleus. I think it's far more likely that Spurious Malleus came back from the dead. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let the audience decide. But anyway, and so he seems to have been going after Ahala, or at least Ahala's property, because Ahala, of course, is in exile, and then also Manucius, who was the prefect of the Green, who reported Malleus's supposed treachery. Doesn't get very far, though, I don't think, because even though he's got the name... A pestilence breaks out. <laughs> and also, I don't think people were digging his, his whole vibe. Yeah, which yeah. is weird. I, I, I feel like the narrative is not making a lot of sense right now. Look, I think it just goes to show that it is not the case that arose by any other name. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anywho, so, yeah, there's, you know, a mm, few things happening. Definitely the plague, I think, is the most significant in 436, but... I feel safe now saying that we can delve into 435. <laughs> uh, wait for the sound effects, just you wait. Uh, we have some consuls. We have mm. Gaius Julius. Okay, yes. Son of, grandson of, question mark, Ulus. Mm -hmm. Question mark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so much is unknown. Uh, a patrician. Consul for the second time. Previously consul mm. in 447. Mm, definitely. So fairly recent. Fairly yeah, recent. fairly recent. Yeah. Doesn't stand out in my memory as significant, that so was... maybe I've forgotten something. No, that was that time period right after the fall of the second December when it was kind of a bit like bleh, like there wasn't a lot of detail. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Phew. Yeah. And we also mm. have Lucius mm. or Proculus. Mm. Uh, Virginius, mm. uh, son of, grandson of, Tricostus. Also a patrician. Also a patrician. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm. We're but, gonna, uh... <laughs> we're going to have some other magistrates though this year, we aren't we, are, Dr. G? We are. <laughs> uh, we are going to have some censors. Mmm. Mm. So we're going to have Gaius Furious. Nice. The return of the Furii. Paculus Fusus. Mm. A patrician. Previously consul in 441. Mm. And Marcus Gaganius, son of Marcus, Masserinus. Definitely patrician. heard that name before. Yes. Yeah. Consul many times, 447. So with old mate Ulus up mm. there. Uh, 443. Yep. And 437. Oof. So only like a couple of years ago, apparently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Made such an impression. <laughs> and, but wait, things get out of hand this year. Mm. Who knew? 
there's going to be a dictator. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm underwhelmed. We've had yeah. so many dictators recently. I was going to say, uh, you're not really giving that the... Um... <laughs> Quintus Servilius, son of Publius, grandson of Spurius, Priscus Fidinus. Mm. Patrician. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah. The guy who captures Fidine. Yes. And we've also got a dictator, then you know you've also got to have a master of the horse. Everybody's got to be in charge of horses, don't they? Yeah. Posthumus Abutius, <laughs> Helva Cornican. Sounds like he has corns. I hope that's not true for him. There are so many <laughs> Roman names which have medical connotations for me, but that's probably because they come from. Mm. Yes, <laughs> yes. The uh, yeah. infiltration of Latin into Western medicine. Yeah. Uh, Consul of 442. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of people that we've seen before in various guises now yes. back for some action. And I'm really excited for what you're going to tell me about this year because I have almost literally nothing else but this list of names. Nice, nice. Well, look, I'm not going to lie. This is the period, I think, that's probably the murkiest I've ever seen. Big call, I know. But wait. It's because there does seem to be a lot of blending of years in mm. Livy's account. I don't think it's quite as clear-cut as it usually is. So, to be honest... Are we in 435? I mean, yes. This I... is why I keep saying I think Spurious Malleus could have just come back from the dead. Is that we don't know what's happening with this chronology right now. <laughs> this is true. This is true. The chronology is all shot to hell. Um, but yeah, I am dividing them up into 436 and 435, but it's probably slightly arbitrary. I don't know. There seems to be a lot of blending going on here. Certainly, I think with the whole plague situation, mm. this might be part of the problems. After all... Livy himself said it's a problematic period in that last episode that we when we talked a lot about his source. Yeah, yeah, it's troublesome. I mean, if everybody's sick, who's going to be riding up the fasty? We're like, no, guys, I've got to take leave. It's a good question. It's a good question. So anyway, so we've got our consuls to start off the year, obviously. So we've got our Gaius Julius and we've got our Lucius Virginius as consuls. The people of Rome are terrified, so they've got a really big job on their hands. Now, as often happens when you've got domestic problems of this magnitude, nobody's super concerned about campaigning outside of Roman territory at this point in time. Now you may wonder, <laughs> why am I saying that? Well, that's because we've been dealing with these issues with the Etruscans for the last couple of years, and this question mark over the loyalties of a Roman colony, Fidene. So I'm mentioning it in the sense that this is a time where that all takes a back burner in the face of, you know, Illness. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so both the patricians and the plebeians are happy that it's a peaceful time in Rome because <laughs> they've got just, oh, I don't know, so much to deal with. <laughs> yeah. However, <laughs> the people from Fidene decide it's time to make a move. They don't have the plague. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean... Yeah, Not let's, yet. Let's just, yeah, let's just, hang on a second. It is an infectious disease. So, <laughs> so there have been some people from Fidene who are uh, all holed up in their, you know, in the mountains, hiding behind their city walls and that sort of thing. They decide, clearly this is a prime time to start pillaging Roman territory because the Romans are just, you know, <laughs> keeping to themselves, isolating. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Socially yeah. distant. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, and so they summon some people from they to, you know, help them out. Oh, yeah, they're you know. new allies. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway, um, the Fliscans are not really interested in restarting the war at this point in time. Now, they have been involved as allies in this conflict up until this point. We've mentioned Ooh, them briefly. I have some, yeah, I have some oh. details on the Fliscans. Okay, because I always, I must admit, I really like their name, Fliscans. Yeah, it yeah. is nice. It does, it rolls off the tongue nicely. Yeah, it's such a classy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, apparently, the mm. Feliscans are a distinct people. I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think so. So they're yeah. not, they don't consider themselves to be Latin, and they don't consider themselves to be Etruscan. Mm, so they are from northern Latium, mm -hmm. so like geographically speaking, southern Etruria. So yeah. they're kind of on this really sort of hazy borderline between these two regions. Yeah. But they actually have a language which is separate from both. Mm, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So they have a capital city, um, which is thought to be on a tuff spur. So 
tuff is a type of stone. Right. Um, on the eastern Monte Cimini. Ah, so, yeah. for those who are like, <laughs> wait a minute, let me get out my Italian <laughs> maps. <laughs> um, and sitting between two tributaries of the Tiber, the okay. Vacano and the Fosso Maggiore. Mm. Or Maggiore, I should say, mm. in my Italian correct. Yeah. And so this is also known as the Etruscan side of the Tiber. So right. they're right on this sort of river edge as well. They have a tradition that they're founded by an Argive hero. Ooh. So a Greek comes over, mm -hmm. a guy called Halesis. And this is a story that Ovid tells us in the Fasti. And they also have a competing tradition mm -hmm. that they have a Chalcedian foundation. Okay. So different Greeks. Yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> isn't that still Greek? <laughs> and yes. despite the fact that they their language is separate and distinct, it is considered a dialect connected mostly to Latin. Okay. Rather than Etruscan. I'm suspicious. They're found <laughs> by Greeks. I, I mean, one should be suspicious. Um, <laughs> and the Feliscans throw in their lot with they. Yes. And uh, also, and then Fidine, well, as, yeah. as that evolves. They are but one at this point in time. Yeah. In many ways. But anyway. But at this point in time, they're not interested in taking part in any war, according mm. to Livy. <laughs> even though their allies are like, please. Please, we, could. we really could use that. Or also the fact that I think everybody knows that Rome is experiencing this pestilence. So even though they seem like, you know, the weak member of the herd, the Fliskins, not having it. Okay, so as a result, it is just the people of Vey and Fidene that end up crossing over the Anio River and mm -hmm. setting up their standards near the Colline Gate, one of the gates of Rome. Because mm. it is surrounded by a wall. <laughs> it is surrounded by the wall. The yeah. Colline Gate is, if you're in Rome today, it's near Termini Station. Mm. Yes, yes. It's also where the Vestal Virgins get buried. And it's also where Crassus, the guy who defeats Spartacus, has one of his most notable military successes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Random facts. It's, yeah, famous gates. <laughs> That's the sort of uh, quality content we're bringing to this Roman table. <laughs> Come on in. Anyway, so of course the people of Rome are now freaking out because... People are at mean. the gates of Rome and they're, they're like, you know what, I haven't been able to control my bell for weeks. Exactly. <laughs> not up to a battlefield confrontation. <laughs> exactly. It's the last thing that you need when you have the plague to have enemy camped right outside the gate. Mm. So as a result, Consul Julius, Julius, whatever... <laughs> Brings into action, starts placing troops along the ramparts and the walls of Rome. Okay. Wow. Meanwhile, the other consul, Virginius, is consulting with the Senate in the Temple of Quirinus, which I believe is on the Quirinal Hill, funnily enough. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say... It, it sounds is. reasonable. Yeah, exactly. All right, now, it's at this point in time, obviously, tough times. What do you need if you're in a tough time? A dictator. Oh, a dictator. Yeah, yes. it's time for a dictator. You know what would be good right now? Somebody to take charge. Exactly, yes. So this is where we have Quintius Servilius, question marks around the rest of his name, <laughs> um, being made dictator. Now, Wiginius is feeling a little awkward at this point in time because his, his colleague is not there to consult about this suggestion, okay? So he wants to discuss it, which is very sweet. And Ulysses, Ulysses gives his consent, Dictator is officially named, and he then gets to choose his master of the horse, his little lieutenant -y type person. And that is, of course, one Postumus Ebutius Helva who is chosen. So, the Dictator, Servilius, he also springs into action. There is no time to be lost! He orders everyone to assemble outside the coal line gate at dawn. Get there. Yeah. We will face the enemy directly. Absolutely. Anyone who is capable of fighting needs to show up. Now, <laughs> drag yourself out of bed. I don't care if you're green about the gills. <laughs> I was going to say, there are some question marks about the definition of this, because normally I would say that probably involves... Most of the men in the population it yes. does it at this point in time. Dear Marsha, yeah. I write to you from my sick bed where I've just I received thought the your order. name was usually Lucretia. <laughs> Not in this case. <laughs> like this guy, he's just stuck in the city. <laughs> Dear Lucretia, I write to you from my sick bed. 
The Four. order. <laughs> too ill, too sad. Too ill, too fat. The order has just come through that we must be at the gate if we're able to fight. But I can't fight. I can't even keep myself upright for any length of time. Will you go in my place, Lucretia? Will you fight for me? No, you will not, because that would be an abomination. Don't you dare emasculate me by going out there. You get even back though, in it. Even though I may be as sick as a little baby, you are not to fight under any circumstances. Anywho. So rude. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So anyone who could fight is supposed to show up at this point in time. They remove the standards from the treasury and they are brought to the dictator. Mm -hmm. The enemy, I presume, notice that there is some activity in Rome itself and they withdraw to higher ground. Smart move. Always a good move in a military engagement to have the higher ground. I have a detail yeah. about the standards, if you're interested. Why? Please <laughs> do. <laughs> Tell me about the standards. Yeah, um, look. Frontinus in okay. his Stratagems, okay. Book Two, Section Eight, yes. subsections Eight to Nine, <laughs> on restoring morale by firmness. <laughs> I'm liking where this is going. Yeah, yeah, I have so little to add to this year, but yet the standards is one of them. Hey, I will this, just this read is, him out in full. This is hard work, yeah. right here. Yeah. The dictator Servilius Priscus, yes. having given the command to carry the standards of the legions against the hostile Faliscans, mm. ordered wait, the. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Whoa. 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 Is it just the Fidenes who were there? Faliscans? Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> they very emphatically said no. <laughs> and yet, I mean, they have this detail. You know what? I think that Did probably... Did come up later? Yeah, no, they do. Oh, yeah. okay. I, think, I think this is showing the blending. The I, blending. I retract yeah. my front No, 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 no. I'll, I'll come back to him. Not at all. Later. Not at all. I would not put money on Livy. <laughs> I, I think that this just goes to show, like, the blending that's happening. Yeah. Mm. All right. Anyway. All right, the standards of the legions yes. are to be brought against the hostile Faliscans. Yeah. Like, it, with the removal of the standards out just the, it put me in mind, and I was like, this is my time to shine. <laughs> but maybe it's not. <laughs> no, no, yeah, um, join it, join it. But he does this and then immediately orders the standard bearer for, to be executed for hesitating to obey. Ooh. So the first one is like, the what now? You, want me, you, you really want me to go get the standards? He's like, kill that man. I'm the dictator, kill that man. Oh, okay. The rest, cowered by this example, advanced against the foe. Wow. Okay. Mm. Well, I mean, that is your right as a dictator, is it not? Mm. Yeah, to just execute someone on sight. That's the whole point of having a dictator. They can make quick snap decisions, which is really helpful when someone's life is involved. Mm. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Yeah, and somebody's life was involved. Mm. All right. Well, anywho. So... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Sorry, Ouch. standard bearer. Sorry, standard bearer. <laughs> Not, not trying to. Overlook. We weep for your loss. Yeah, we really do. Anyway, Sir Willius starts marching his Roman forces to meet the enemy, and mm -hmm. they end up meeting. <laughs> they meet. They end up meeting up near Nomentum, not in Nomentum, near Nomentum. I say that because Nomentum has no part in this conflict. So I just want to make that very, very, very clear. Very much not involved. <laughs> yeah. It's also one of those interesting areas, which is in Latium, apparently near the Sabine frontier, but it is Latin. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, it has also been mentioned as being originally a colony of Alba. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. I'm also throwing those details in there. Um, so it's also a colony of Alba, along with your favorite named place, Crustumerium. <laughs> it yeah. is great. And Fidene, <laughs> of all places. It's about four miles from the Tiber. Mm, mm, all anyway. right. Anyway, so the battle ensues with the Etruscans, and mm. the Romans are appearing to be getting the upper hand because the Etruscans end up retreating. Servilius, dictator that he is, ends up pursuing the retreating foe, pushes them back into the city of Fidene. The Romans then, of course, kick into siege mentality. <laughs> Sound effect siege for siege. mentality. Yeah. Things moving very slowly. <laughs> uh, where they surround Fidene with a rampart, so obviously some kind of temporary fence. Yeah, yeah, defensive wall. Well, not defensive in this case. More, offensive. More predatory. I'm offended by that fence. Yeah, exactly. Um, but unfortunately, they are unable to capture the city using scaling ladders. Classic. <laughs> Classic siege technique, um, because Fidene is apparently very well fortified. 
Mm, yes. You'd want to be after switching sides <laughs> up and be like, I'm ditching the Romans for the Etruscans. Forethought, yes. <laughs> Prepare the defences. <laughs> well, funny you should say that actually, because there's another thing to their defences which is very impressive. They also aren't going to be able to starve them out because they had plenty of corn. They were very well prepared. Oh, yeah, so maybe that's why there was a grain shortage. <laughs> Peter Day has been hoarding grain <laughs> for years at yeah. this point, being like, we can hold out. i still got some delicious something here. <laughs> exactly. Got plenty of Doritos. They last forever. Mm. Even when they're stale, they still taste good. Oh, look, yeah. you do what you got to do when you're hungry. Exactly. Now, this is a bit of a pickle, and it causes Sir Willius to say, I'm reviewing the situation. That's a throwback to Oliver in case any of you are fans of musical theatre. Anyway, he's very familiar with the region. <laughs> he's got to rethink how everything is going. I mean, obviously, we're not far from Rome, so I think most people are pretty familiar with the region. It's not really like a, you know, kudos to him or anything like that. Anyway, but he decides that he's going to attack Fidene in the on the farther side of the city because... In this particular area, the way that the city is positioned, it's, I, I guess they felt when they were originally setting it up and setting up the defenses that it didn't really need to have as strong defenses because naturally it was kind of mm. like a, you know. It's got a natural defense yeah, yeah, like it's, element it's, to the, it. Yeah, and it also, I guess, wouldn't be maybe the most logical place for any attacking armies to you know, launch their attack. <laughs> well, we wouldn't want to accuse the Romans of logic now, would we? <laughs> so, he decides that what he's going to do is another classic siege technique, which he's going to start to drive a mine into the citadel of Fidene. So, I, I gather from that that what he's probably doing is he's digging under the fortifications. I have a real yeah. problem with the idea that they're going to tunnel into somewhere. Hey, a they did it. They did it in Castle. <laughs> Well, but, yeah, but this—I mean, this takes yeah. a long time. That you get to be dictator for six months. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on like how substantial are the walls we're talking about here. I mean, sure, it's well fortified for 435 BCE. <laughs> what is that? What is that? What does that even mean? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we should envision like a Lord of the Rings style castle <laughs> yeah. at this point in time, which is very disappointing. But it is this is the kind of technique that they do use in this sort of warfare. I mean, even think of World War One trenches. They were battles for underground. Yeah, I'm too. not completely against it. I'm yeah. just a bit like, I feel like logistically it's just not the greatest strategy wait, at this wait, point in history. Wait, you haven't heard the whole plan. <laughs> oh. Okay, so Servilius also only dedicates part of his army to digging this. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> because, because, because the rest of the army is going to maintain the siege in like an obvious place like hey look at us besieging you <laughs> oh, okay. mustache twirl and so the people in the city are like well this is the attack and yeah, so that's the, that's the siege <laughs> exactly they're distracted by that and therefore they had no idea that they were being attacked by this sneaky mine into their citadel until the city was already taken Jeez. Mm. so you can have all the doubts that you like but it worked <laughs> According to Livy? <laughs> hey. All right. <laughs> he gets his information from Augustus Caesar, thank you very much. And that should be good enough for you or anyone. <laughs> mm. Anyway. Mm. So, back in Rome, we seemingly <laughs> forget about this. Yeah. Forget about this very quickly. We're back to the senses. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got our senses. This is apparently when they approve a public building, the Villa Publica, mm. okay, okay. Uh, which is set up in the campus Martius, and it is in this year that the census was taken there for the first time. Now, okay. I believe that this building, unfortunately, no longer remains, but we have a rough idea of what it looks like because it has appeared on some coins, I think. Okay. Mm. So this Villa Publica is supposed to be the spot where the census is now conducted. It is. We yes. like rock up to the campus Martius to be counted. Yeah. We cool. need an official building. Mm. We need a wall. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Now, this is again one of those years where I'm like, is it the end of 435? Am I blending into 434? I don't really know. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that this is 
where I would end 4.35. Oh, okay. I do have some more details on okay. this year, actually. Please I, do. It's going to seem a little bit odd, I think, but maybe it's in keeping with the fact that we're dealing with plague and pestilence. Yeah. Um, but there is this idea that comes through in scholarship, mm. and I'm referring here to Wilson's 2021 book, Dictator, mm. The Evolution of the Roman Dictator. What a handy volume to have on. <laughs> it seems like a, the thing to read when, when we're heading into this kind of territory. Yeah. But he talks about um, Servilius Priscus, our okay. dictator for this year, yeah. as somebody who may be a candidate for um, being in a slightly religious position mm. as dictator as well. Okay. There's this idea of um, a nail-driving dictator. And you might be like, what? <laughs> what? Oh, he, he drives the nails into the walls of the temple, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So driving some nails into... The... <laughs> I thought that was my hearing. I was like, oh, what? The who nail? <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is a thing that is attested in certain cases. Mm -hmm. um, this idea of... Um, I'm going to quote a little passage um, from Livy. Ooh, I know. How dare you? The Senate ordered that a dictator be named on account of there being a need for driving a nail. Ah, uh -huh. mm. okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, this crops up later as well. Right. But it's thought that potentially this idea of the nail driving ritual, yes. um, pushing it into the door of the temple, yeah. is something that might be of Etruscan origin. Right. Um, which temple is this? I'm not sure. Okay, okay. Yeah. Like this is a detail that I haven't I haven't pursued in in its absolute form. No, so, you know, I feel like that's a question I probably should know the answer to myself. I've just temporarily forgotten. Um, I, that sounds so stupid. I mean, it, it, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Maybe hold that space, and when I know what the temple is, I'll <laughs> I'll do some more research. <laughs> that's what I'll do. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So into the temple. Okay. Yeah. Pause yeah. this video. Yeah. Let's just, <laughs> um, so this idea that somehow you could. Fix a problem yes. with iron and prayer, uh -huh. and it is also obviously has tangible sort of military connotations as well because it's being done by the dictator. Right. So there's this odd sense coming through that we're potentially in this early period of the dictatorship. Right. Like many things in Rome, nothing is necessarily just political. Everything is bound mm. up in ritual process as True. well, and the relationship with the gods. Yeah. And the dictator doesn't is no different from anybody else in that regard. True. In having to make sure that the gods are appeased. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, all magistrates, there's always those religious connotations to their role and things that they have to carry out mm. in a religious capacity, even though they're not holding, like, a priesthood or something. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. That's, that's the only detail. No, I like it. That's, I really like it. it. And I'm, uh, yeah, keen to, keen to hear more about the temple. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So does that mean we can pass now into 434? <gasps> 434. Okay, 434 BCE. What have we got, Dr. G? Who's the magistrate? Ah. Magistrates. Well, <laughs> well um, in the spirit of things being complicated. Yeah, there's a whole lot of confusion. There's a lot of people involved yeah. this year. So, it's 434 BCE. Yes. I'd love to tell you that Dionysius Halicarnassus has returned to me, but he has not. Ah. Um, but... We have two pairs of consuls. Mm -hmm. Awkward times already, <laughs> frankly. Um, the first pair will be the pair that gives their name to the year. Mm -hmm. And weirdly, that's Gaius Julius Ullus, uh, patrician, mm -hmm. former consul in 447 and last year, 435. Yes. Yeah. And a Lucius or Proculus with Guineas Tricostus, patrician, consul in 435. If those names don't sound familiar, I don't know if anything ever will. <laughs> well, this is this is the awkward thing about them being consuls, right? Mm. There is some there are some questions about can people hold the consulship for two years in a row? I kind mm. of think they can't. But then again, it is early days in Rome. It is early days in Rome, yeah. and this seems to be something uh, like something funny is going on. It seems, um, but for some reason they carry over. Maybe it's because they've only completed part of their term, and the dictators come in and gone. But it seems odd anyway. Or well, maybe it's because of the military situation. Who knows? Yeah, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Then yes. we have a second pair. We of do concerts. have a second pair. Marcus Manlius mm. Capitolinus Vulso. Mm. <laughs> Patrician. Yeah. And Quintus Sulpicius, son of Servilius Camerinus Praetextatus. Ooh. Also a patrician. <laughs> 
Then we have some military tributes with consular power. So this year is a bit of a, it feels like a bit of a train wreck already. Two sets of consuls yeah. and some military tributes with consular power. And you're like, these guys, they're not doing it for us. Sweep them out. Bring in somebody else. <laughs> um, then we get Servilius Cornelius Cossus. Ooh. Patrician. Cossus, yes. Marcus Manlius Capulinus of Ulso. So mm. it seems to transition from being a consul to being a military tribute with consular power. Naturally. And yeah. also his companion, Quintus <laughs> Sulpicius Camarinus Praetex Tardus. Wait a minute. Yeah. I mean, it, why would you There's some shift? tomfoolery going on here. Yeah, why no. would you shift? I, it doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to no. pretend that this makes sense. If you've got a pair of consuls and it's working, don't change it. If you need a third person... Maybe just allocate one military tribune of the consular power to join the two consuls. <laughs> Why do they have to change their position? Nobody knows. Yeah. It gets worse though. Yeah. We have a dictator. Of course. The trifecta. <laughs> this is the trifecta. 434B is here. The trifecta. You can have it all, Rome. You've just got to keep putting people into power. Yeah. It's Mamercus Aemilius, mm-hmm. son of Marcus, Mamus. I, I always hate this name, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't like it. I mean, Mem- Memesinus, I think we decided on last time. Yeah. Memesinus, yeah, yeah. I, I guess it, yeah. I feel like with Latin, it's like, do it I go for very... the hard C or do I go for the I know, but it sounds C. very hip hop. I, I agree, like, the hard C is awkward to say, so I, I prefer Memesinus, but it sounds like, you know, Memesinus. Good <laughs> <in the> house. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> a patrician. Yeah. Um, they were a military tribune with consular power in 438. Yes. Um, appointed to face the threats of the Feliscans and the Etruscans. Mm. And also seems to be the person who limits the censorship to one and a half years. (gasps) Don't spoil my story. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. I don't know how it happened, so I'm looking forward (laughs) to how that comes about. And they appoint Master of the Horse, Ulius Postumius, Tubertus. Mm. Tubertus. I hate that name too. Oh, it's kind of cool. I like it. No. It's a bit like... Not a fan. A patrician. Sounds like gross potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. So I do have some detail about this year. Now, once again, Livy is actually telling me a little bit about his source material to try and explain the train wreck <laughs> that is this list of magistrates that we have here. So apparently, Dr. G, it is Licinius Mesa or maker, I mean, hard see, saucy, whatever. Uh, he's the one that says there are same the same consoles from 435 into 434. So Okay, yeah. so a source that's reasonably closer than Livy is. Yeah, and we've also, we know that Livy cites this guy quite a lot. He's obviously someone that Livy relies heavily on. However, we also have Valerius Antias and Quintus Tubero. As sources cited. Mm, I did my study on these two. Yeah. Because I have nothing for this year. <laughs> he, they say that it is Marcus Manlius and Quintus Sulpicius, and they apparently were drawing on the linen rolls for their information. And we have mentioned the linen rolls before. Mm. They are literally rolls made of linen. Yeah. <laughs> With records of magistrates, etc., on them. Um, but both say that older historians had claimed that these guys were, in fact, military tribunes with consular power. Uh, it's a confusing time. It really is, yeah. Um, like any maker, David. <laughs> it's very, very unclear. Um, he basically apparently is very confident with his version of things. He's just like, this is how it is. No questions. Tubero, however apparently said that he was uncertain about what was the truth. Like, who were the consuls? Were there military tribunes with consular power? Who knows? He was a bit more uncertain. Livy, as a result, is also in a total heap right now. <laughs> Cannot make sense of it. And he says to you, you know what? This all happened a really long time ago. Get off my back. I'm doing the best that I can yeah, with exactly. the limited resources I have available yeah. to me. Let's th- not get caught up in it. <laughs> so I think one of the things to keep in mind when we're thinking about Valerius Antius and Aelius Tubero is that we're dealing with other writers from the first century BCE. So uh, they're, they're writing a little bit earlier than Livy, but they're writing in the same century as yes. Livy is. So Whereas Mesa, Mesa is a little bit yeah. earlier than that. And yeah. so these two only maybe know quite as much as Livy could possibly <laughs> find out anyway. Yes. Um, and their chances of getting hold of better material is yeah. pretty slim. I guess the thing is, we do know that whilst Livy gives us these little 
insights into his process, which make him seem like a decent historian, we know that he doesn't often actually like leave his home to go and look at source material himself. Um, so I guess it's a question of, we don't really probably know very much about these guys and whether they actually, do they like travel around and look at different, you know, like, you know, lists of magistrates? Did they, you know, did they have other things? It's, they're just so fragmentary, it's hard to say. Yeah, they yeah. are fragmentary and we're not really sure. We have a little bit of detail yeah. on them. Valerius Antius is listed as one of the younger analysts, which is quite cute. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and... He is thought to have only written after 50 BCE. Right. That is very close to Livy. Yeah. So, and his work goes from um, the foundation of the city, yep. the hypothetical, <laughs> um, to around about 91, which we have a fragment for. Okay. So, covering a good stretch of time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, because we've only got him in fragments, he wrote heaps, um, but we don't have a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. And he was interested in, wait for it, he's kind of like one of those sort of um, military-esque historians. He's right. super interested in like the distribution of troops in the provinces right, and things okay. like that. Um, and interested in colonies being founded and how omens are navigated. Right. Um, so it's all like sort of process driven in a way. Um, is part of his focus. Yeah, nice. Um, which is quite... Would be interesting to have more of him, I was going to say, it sounds like a bit of a loss. Yeah, it definitely is. And I think likewise with um, Aelius Tubero. Mm. So he's a jurist right. and a historian. Yes. And he is the son of Lucius Aelius Tubero, who was also a historian and also a friend of Cicero. Oh. So, like, Tubero is mm. mixing in, you know, some interesting circles. Definitely, definitely. Um, he fought in the army of Pompey at Pharsalus. Ooh. Yeah, okay. so, you know, he's got some experience. I to tell the tale. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, he dedicates himself ultimately to jurisprudence. Right. And historiography. Okay. And, <laughs> and so, this seems to be... Um, the thing that really drives his career yeah. um, is like, you know, being involved as a senator ultimately yeah. in Rome, but also publishing works. Mm. Um, some of them judicial in nature, some of them historical in nature. So he has a 14 books that we know of, um, Roman history from the Punic Wars at the very earliest, it seems. Um, and it seems like he does become a source for others to use as well. But yeah, we're not... We don't really know the substance of like what he was trying to do with that work mm. or like what his focus was necessarily. Okay. Such is the fragmentary nature of the source. Well, look, it's comforting to know that Livy was at least using multiple sources and comparing their accounts. So for those of you who think Livy is a bad historian, eat it. <laughs> I don't think he's a bad no, he's historian. He's, he's, I think he's, he's doing the best he can. He cops a lot of flack, though, you have to admit. Anywho, so to return to what's actually happening outside of... <laughs> I'd love to know what's actually happening in this year. <laughs> what is actually happening. <laughs> um, so the Etruscans are obviously terrified because at the end of the previous year, the Romans have captured Fidene. The people of Ve are very worried that they might be next on the Romans' <gasps> list. And I think that's probably... A fair assumption. <laughs> foreshadowing, foreshadowing, foreshadowing. <laughs> now, this is where the Feliscans come into my story again. Oh. Okay, so the Feliscans... Oh, without my standard story again. <laughs> look, it could apply here. It could apply here. They're feeling a bit guilty about the fact that they had technically backed out of an alliance. You know, they weren't there in times of need. Um, and so the people of Vey and the Feliscans decide to send envoys around to the 12 other major cities in Etruria. Okay. And these are all cities, um, they basically all say, yeah, sure, we'll get together, have a council proclaimed. Um, i to do that again. Okay. So, the city of A and the Feliscans decide to send envoys around to the 12 cities in Etruria. Okay. And what they want is they want to have this council proclaimed for all of the people in Etruria at the shrine of Voltumna. Voltumna. Okay. Now, the Roman Senate are worried that tensions are going to flare up again, and so they decide that they're going to choose a dictator. 
Now that seems a little preemptive. <laughs> I mean, sure, okay, you can see the Etruscans potentially <laughs> rallying around. Shiver my timbers, my bones, something's coming. A dictator. <laughs> yeah, it just seems a little, you know, maybe they're just getting into the habit. It's like a muscle reflex. Like, <gasps> you know what this needs? <gasps> yeah. And so this is where we get Amelius coming back into the story. And he chooses, as you said, all this postumni... <laughs> He chooses Aulus Posthumius Tubertus as his master of the horse, mm -hmm. as we mentioned. So now we've got our trifecta there. We've mentioned consuls. We've mentioned military tribunes with consular power. And now we've got our dictator. The Romans are putting a lot of energy into getting ready for the war that is to come. And I can kind of, again, understand if there's potential for the Etruscans to unite. It's not just going to be two cities that they're facing. This is a more serious threat, for sure. Okay. However, things are not going to quite turn out the way that they were anticipating. It's all going to fizzle out quite quickly <laughs> as it would turn out. So, merchants end up reporting that the people of Ve had been refused assistance. Okay, so they're, they're not going to help out the people of Ve. Now, presumably, the reason why merchants are involved in this story at all is because if all the cities are meeting together in a council, it might have become the scene for like a fair or like some trading or something like that. This feels like the first time we've ever heard about merchants being involved in any of these I know, stories, to be honest. I know, specifically a thing. Anyway, and so their response, the merchants, is that you started this war all on your own, okay? You're going to have to use your own forces and not drag other people into the alliance. Because you know what? When you started the war, you were probably hoping that things were going to go well for you. And you were doing all that on your own. And you're probably going to enjoy that success all by yourself. Now that you're struggling, you want to share it around. You want to share around that struggle. No thank you. You are fair weather friends. And we have no interest in pursuing this with you. You had no contact with us when everything was going well it's only when you're down in your luck that you want to speak to us now so it all kind of fizzles out <laughs> there's no big etruscan alliance happening there is no war coming right at this moment but we have a dictator we do hurrah <laughs> now this is the thing mamercus he feels ripped off <laughs> <laughs> i didn't get my dictatorship yeah he wanted he wants to do something meaningful with his dictatorship so he decides I know, I'll do something that will benefit the city of Rome itself if I can't conquer an external enemy. So, this is where he decides the senses are becoming a little worrying. Things need to be cut down to size. Either because they hold too much power or because they hold that power for too long. How dare they? I know. So. I would like to go into the details about the censorship in a sec, mm. but let's just proceed with the narrative for now. So he summons an assembly, and as the gods have seen fit to take care of Rome's enemies so kindly and made it all come to nothing, <laughs> he wants to put forward this law that's going to limit the censorship to a year and a half. Not a day more, thank you very much. The law was passed the very next day because the people are like, yes, we are on board with this idea. You're right. We do what, need to limit yeah. their total power. I wonder what we don't know about the censorship in this early period because this does seem to come out of almost nowhere. I agree, and that's why I want to come back to that in a second. Mm. After this is passed, Mimurcus then lays down his dictatorship. The people are thrilled with him. So thrilled that they walk him back to his door like it's a first date. <laughs> wow. Yeah, everything's, just, everything's going very well. It's all very joy. He's a very popular little chappy, okay? However, there are some people in Rome that are not so happy with the situation. And you'd be right if you guess that those people are the censors. <laughs> I mean, I just got voted in and I thought I was going to have at least, I don't know, more than a year and a half to like, you know, go around and do my business. Yes. Got to build this building. That's going to take longer <laughs> than this time. <laughs> yeah. So they're furious. So in response, they remove Mamercus from his tribe. Oh, unlucky. Yeah. Okay. And they also increased his taxes eight times over. 
Ouch. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Okay. Well, you can live yeah. in the power of the senses in some ways, but you didn't think far enough ahead, Mamurkus. <laughs> so this means that he has lost the right to vote at this point in time. I was going to say, yeah. so if he's removed from his tribe, is he placed into a different tribe? I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Mm. <laughs> Uh, no, is the short answer. So, Does this make him a non-citizen? Well, it's a weird, it's kind of like a weird limbo land yeah. in that he still pays taxes, but he's lost a lot of the political rights that come with that. Gee, it's like being a woman in almost any period in history up until the last mm. hundred years. Anyway. Maybe we can turn Mamercus into an ally. <laughs> now, Mamercus apparently endures this all very well. I mean... This is quite the blow. He's clearly rich. <laughs> Eight times his usual tax rate. Come on. I'd be furious. <laughs> Leave me alone. Exactly, yeah. But look, he apparently is like, look, I know where this is coming from. It's coming from a place of hurt and trauma. No, he doesn't say it. But he, he does understand why he's being targeted this way. So he's just like, I'm going to be zen about it. Okay. Now, the patricians come into this story. The patricians are not actually happy with the office of censor being restricted. Well, of course not. I mean, it's part of their purview. <laughs> exactly. I mean, <laughs> they are the ones that are censors. I mean, it, it is yeah. weird because he's kind of gone rogue because Mamercus is a patrician himself. That's the weird part. Exactly. So there seems to yes. be some sort of factionalization going on here between the ones that get into the censorship and the ones that don't. Well, I mean, we did talk about him being an ally. Maybe he's one of these weird patricians that, I don't know, believes in equality. Maybe that's why the people like him so much. Mm. Not equality, that's too far. <laughs> but you know what I mean. More equality, greater equality. Mm. Yeah, Getting close, but not too close. <laughs> anyway. However, they also are not impressed by the way that the censors have chosen to react to his law okay. being passed. The, yeah. the, the patricians as a The patricians of the, of the group, they're, yeah. They're, they're not impressed by... They're not impressed by Mercus or the censors. The poor patricians. They just don't like anybody. You know what? I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed about this, this, and this. Yeah. <laughs> However, they kind of look at it as like a column A, column B situation, a pros and a cons. They're like, look, we know that we're going to be living our lives under the power of the censors for longer than any of us could ever possibly personally hold the office. And that is dangerous. Okay. What does that mean? Well, I, I guess it means that you're always going to be under the you're going to be under the power of multiple senses in your life if you live a decent time. Okay, right? but you could only be censored once at well, the very most. I feel like that's the implication, right. or, or at least if you hold the office, you're only going to hold it for a set amount of time mm -hmm. you know so i think that's what it's trying to say okay basically. but yeah. The, yeah the legacy of the censorship exceeds those exactly the yeah. term of the exact, the i've got itself. the exact wording here because it is a little tricky livy well the translation of livy anyway says since each of them perceived that he should be subjected to the censor for a longer period and more frequently than he should hold the censor's office they recognize mm. the danger I, I think that's what it means yeah yeah anyway so they're not fans. <laughs> the people are completely outraged that Mamercus is being treated this way. And nobody could have stopped them at this point in time from attacking the censors, ripping them limb from limb, except Mamercus himself, of course. Aww. Who's being very zen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now this is where, so this is roughly where I think we come to the end of 434 BCE. This is roughly where I thought it might be a good moment to pause and think about this position of censor <laughs> because it was actually not that long ago that we were talking about holding the censors for the first time in a while mm. and yet all of a sudden here we are. Here we are <laughs> and it's now time for census reform. Yeah. Now as with all the offices that we talk about in this early Republican period if you ever look up the office of censor you will see the same thing which is that the practice varied greatly in the early periods. It's not as set in stone as it will become later on, where they, you know, they hold it for, you know, a limited amount of time. They hold it, you know, this frequently, that sort of thing. Okay, so there's definitely some variation happening here. However, the general gist of being a censor, it's not just all about data collection. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a real shame. Just when you thought we were about to get statistical, we don't. Is it religious? Well, it, the censor's job is to basically overlook the morals of the community. 
okay, which is why I think the patricians feel the way that they do about you know, the potential threat that this position holds. Which is funny because it got created officially because the consuls didn't want to do the paperwork. <laughs> They're like, I'm sick of this paperwork. Can yeah. we create a new position for this bureaucracy? There's a lesson in there somewhere. Anyway, but basically, yes, at some point, it, they developed the capacity to censure somebody. I'm trying to over-exaggerate my pronunciation of that so that it's very clear I'm not saying censor. Censure somebody. Okay? Mm -hmm. The idea being that if they did that, then someone would be removed from their tribe and could potentially therefore lose the right to vote because that is how you vote in your tribe. But you still get the incredible pleasure of paying your taxes. Okay, now this is the this is the situation. No taxation without <laughs> representation. Exactly. But you presumably did something to deserve that punishment. So yes. I guess it's like if we send people to prison, if you look at how historically we've treated criminals, sometimes they lose you know, certain rights. Not just yeah. their freedom, but... The censorship yeah. functions as a way of uh, policing, essentially, who gets to do what in particular areas of society. Yes, absolutely. Now, technically speaking, I think you could be placed in another tribe, but if they're obviously removing you from your tribe because you've done something wrong, that is... Well, the unlikely. idea that you could join another yeah. tribe, it's not like... Like, you should only be in your tribe. Mm. Your tribe. <laughs> so if they remove you from your tribe, your only options are really to go back into your tribe when they agree that it's okay to do so. It's not like you can be like, well, I'm just going to join those guys over there. And yeah. they're like, this is not your tribe. Yes, exactly. So that's what we can see happening here in this situation. Okay, that's basically, I think it's the def I mean, definitely the first case we've come across mm. of this sort of thing happening. Um, now, eventually, not sure about at this point in time, maybe at this point in time, they also supervised membership of the Senate. So they oh, also yeah. police their behaviour and that sort of thing. This is something that the, the censors are famous for. Definitely. But I'm not sure that we can really confirm one way or the other for no. this period. It seems unlikely to me mm. that that would be the case, but just mentioning it because, you know, it's part of the office. We might do a special episode on them later on. And they could also take the horse and status from equestrians. Oh, not the ponies. Don't take Matilda. <laughs> I know. How yeah. will I get to battle now? Not Black Beauty. It's a whole different story. Um, and eventually they will accrue... <laughs> <laughs> no, Mr. Ed, no! <laughs> <laughs> um, eventually they're going to accrue even more power where they're involved in kind of business dealings for Rome. So they can also oversee um, the leasing of revenue producing public property like lands, forests and mines. They can also arrange for the collection of revenue. They could sell the right to collect taxes to the publicani. Okay, not a popular group of people in Roman society. Um, and do all sorts of things like that. Um, and so they eventually will get all that kind of power. But again, at this point in time, I don't think they have that kind of power. Nor does Rome have quite the resources that would require this sort of thing. So this is, I think, a, a much later part of their role. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we're seeing the stirrings of the what will become this kind of censorship with all of this kind of particular power yeah. beginning to come into its fore. Clearly there's something, the suggestion here is that there's an overstepping of the expectation of what they would do. Yeah. Definitely. And there's an attempt to curtail that. Yeah. And so, and this is generally how rules develop anyway. It's like people do something and you're like, no, no, not that. <laughs> we got to make far. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then they put it on a stone being like, not that. Yes. And you're like, oh man. <laughs> exactly. Look, so. I always think if Augustus wanted to get his greedy little paws on the power of a particular office, then they had something going on for it, and this is no exception. <laughs> oh no, the censorship, by the time yeah. we get to Augustus, the censorship is an incredibly powerful position. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what's actually happening here in, what, 434 BCE? Yep. It's a little bit more up for grabs, I think. Yeah, so I'm going to therefore close the curtains on another very confusing, mystifying year in Rome's history. Goodbye, 434. And hello to the partial pick. 
All right, Dr. G, so the partial pick is where we sum up how rem has been tracking for the last year or two. They have five categories. Each category has 10 golden eagles up for grabs, meaning that they're going to get a score out of a total of... 50 yeah, golden eagles. Yeah, we can eagles. do math. Oh, like it's a struggle. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, humanity's for a reason. The struggle is real. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, Rome, I'm not anticipating a great score, but let's see what happens. First category, military cloud. Well, okay. Actually, there was that whole siege and sneaky tunnel system. Yep. Now yeah, that was pretty impressive. Absolutely. If you believe such tales. Which I do. <laughs> <laughs> Read it in Libby, it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so look, I think that's got to be what, like a six, maybe? Well, I mean, just for the sheer effort involved, I yeah. give them an eight. I get fair enough. It's like a tunnel system, like a mine under a wall to get into a citadel. Like, that's not easy work. While you're keeping up the facade of a real siege at the front of the city. I know. It does make <laughs> you wonder, given that people have been very ill with plague recently, how are there so many people that you can divert their attention? Is it just one guy throwing rocks at the wall? <laughs> And they're Where flinging, they're flinging the soft leavings that they've created along the way. <laughs> nice, mm. nice, very elegantly phrased. <laughs> All right, so we're we gonna go with. Look, I, I think eight might be too much. I think, I think let's go seven. All right, okay, seven, seven, seven. Right. It is. Okay. Our next category is diplomacy. Well, as we always say, there's rarely diplomacy when there's warfare in Rome, and I don't think that there is really anything to talk about. It does seem like everybody was like, don't drag me into your mess. Yeah. And, and then there was like, maybe we could limit the powers of the censorship. And they were like, no, we yeah. punish you. So it doesn't seem like there's anybody negotiating anything around here. Not really. So yeah, I'm going to unfortunately give them a zero for that. No, I think that's mm. fair. Yeah. I agree. Mm. Our next category is expansion. No, unfortunately <laughs> not. We've I mean, expanded our minds. <laughs> well, look, I mean, they have captured Fidine, this is true. Mm. However, Fidine was technically theirs to begin with. They had already captured it, yes. they? Just like a couple of years ago. Yeah, so look, I'll give them a one for <laughs> recapturing their colony. Okay, mm. yeah. All right, Weirtus. Hmm. How much of a man are you, ancient Rome? <laughs> Let's find out together. Well, I mean, there, there's some things going on here. I mean, we do have quite a number of dictators to choose from. Does it amount to weird to us, though? This is the question. Yeah, lots of men in positions of power. Yeah. How much weird to us? I mean, it seems like Roman chaos. Not, it not does. Virtue. And look, whilst there are some clever ideas and that sort of thing, I don't know that anything is quite at that level. But Mercus is quite popular, and I wonder why that might be. And I'm well. not sure that we've received enough information to be really sure whether it's He's from weird or not. a class traitor. <laughs> <laughs> I do love a class traitor. <laughs> Join us on the working class no, side. I have no idea, honestly, what he's up, up to. And Sevilius, the dictator from the previous year, like, he has won an impressive victory, but there's no mention of, like, a triumph or... I mean, like, it's, it's through siege. <laughs> I don't think the Romans respond as well to... Siege oh. warfare of that nature. Unless you besiege them, capture the city, and whilst you're capturing it, do something badass <laughs> along the way. I don't, wow, the requirements I, are so high. Well, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not getting a strong sense that like he is being held up as any particular... Yeah, we're not really sure. Yeah. Yeah. If there's a question mark, oh. I think we'll leave it. If in doubt, leave it out. If it's a maybe, it's a no. Yeah. Um... <laughs> And finally, Ryan Rand. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just like it's just like online dating. Um, it's the citizen score. Okay, well, kind of, in the sense that <laughs> I mean, they seem pretty happy with the sensorial reforms. Look, the plague so. seems to have lifted. Oh, well, that's good news. Yeah, there's their victory with Fidene, which is good for them, obviously. And then there's also, yes, as you say, the censorship thing and the fact that war didn't happen again. Oh. Yeah, you know, like it could have, you know, it could have been really bad. All <laughs> the, the absence of war <laughs> is well, a huge positive. <laughs> they were getting ready for it. All the questions were coming for them. And then all of a sudden, they weren't. They weren't. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, the, uh, even though they're mad about the fact that their champion has been treated badly, I don't know that that really affects their quality of life so much. Mm. So. I'm going to say maybe like a three or a four.
maybe. I was going to say, on the balance, it's like maybe a five. I mean, they had to do You're some. Very generous. They had to do some <laughs> military work, but they also didn't get invaded by all of Etruria, so. Yeah. Look, why don't we say a four? A four. A four. Okay. okay. Well, whew, a significantly better score has eventuated. <laughs> but mind you, we have been doing two years together. Yeah, they've got a chance for a redemption they with do. two years of history on the they table. Do. So for these two years, Dr. G, we have a total of 12 Golden Eagles. Oh. Well done, Ro. You're still not passing very much. <laughs> <laughs> still some par, but there we yeah. are. And you know what? I think we have fulfilled our promise. I think there was more cheerful stuff in this episode than the last episode. <laughs> there you go. We're on the up and up. We are, indeed. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure, as always, to chat with you. Thanks, Dr. Red. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> Until next time. Richter shirt. Yeah. Mm. Richter scale, God. We are at it. <laughs> She's turning the page. I am. Oh, we're this. in the blooper section of the video. <laughs> still go Wait, I did actually when I turned the page. I forgot the camera was still recording. Yeah. It's the no. danger of the camera. <laughs> oh, it's been a busy time for Rome. Mm. I hate that thing my pajama pants. Just suddenly realized I'm probably sitting far enough back that you can. You no, can. no, you no. can edit it there. No, no. Zoom in, zoom in, <laughs> zoom in. <laughs> it's gonna be fine. Doctor G's being very kind because I slept it. <laughs> so, uh, the jam pants is about as good as it's gonna get. <laughs> Daylight saving is a killer. I it is. Well, it is when you go out the night before. I saw Mulan Rouge. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, the real question, <laughs> now that I'm here, yes. uh, the real question is, what are we calling this episode? <laughs> yes, good question indeed. Um, should we call it the Triple Threat? The triple threat. Because we have that year with the dictator, <laughs> or should we just call it dictators everywhere, or like, mm. um, it's like an alliterative way of saying lots of dictators. A dozen dictators. <laughs> <laughs> dictators by the dozen. <laughs> yeah. uh. Dictators by the dozen I like, or triple threat. I like either of those. I'll just check that I'm not missing anything by else. The dozen.